Lord gets aggravated with us and he gets angry with us. You know, the Bible says, you know, be angry but sin not. And I get angry at times. I don't do it in a sinful way. I'm not going to say colorful words and do colorful things and ugly and mean things. But I do get angry. I got angry at the devil this morning. And I told him in prayer I was mad at him. And I told him that he, you know, put him right back in his place. Have you ever had somebody who gets out of their place and tries to rule you or bully you or overpower you and you have to put them back in their place nicely but firmly? Excuse me. Um, we're not going to go there. We're not going to do that. Sometimes you have to do it with your children. Sometimes you have to do it with other people. Uh, one of my boys was younger. Quick example. One of my boys was younger and they called me on the phone and it's, it's just a natural reaction to a, to a kid. And, uh, I don't remember which one it was, and it doesn't really matter. And they said, where are you at? I said, I'm at the store. Well, you haven't been home in a while. I want to know where you were. And immediately I said, um, excuse me, you're my son. My husband don't talk to me that way. You're my son, and you don't have no business asking me that way. And they returned and said, I'm sorry, Mama, really I was worried, and so... That's why I came across that way. And I said, it's okay if you're worried, but next time you call me, don't yell at me like that. And they said, well, when I woke up, you weren't here. And I don't remember. It was, it, they were like seven, eight years old, something. Somebody was there with them. I think it was Christina babysitting them. But they, they were mad because I wasn't there and they were worried. And sometimes you have to put them back in their place in a sense of, excuse me, my priorities is my priorities and you can step back. I'm talking about this in the way of the Lord. I'm not talking about this in a carnal in a carnal way. I'm giving an example so that we can try to think of it in our own personal life. So <clears throat> I want to give an example here how that uh, and in contrast of in our own lives, how we, we make our priorities and the things that we do. It says the work of the house of the Lord stopped and the people began to work on their own projects. The temple was no longer their first order of business. When they returned to their homeland, they came for one reason, to rebuild the temple of God. They knew that they would need places to live. They knew that eventually they would need to plow the ground and plant crops. But their priority was to complete the house of the Lord. Now, when they had become discouraged, they had ceased to the work of the temple ceased their work in the temple. They became distracted. Other things being taken, taken their time and energy. We as believers must be careful that we do not allow our lives to be distracted by less important things. Our adversary, the devil, will try every trick in the book to hinder our spiritual lives. He will fight us, accuse us, and degrade us. He will deliberately try to distract us from the work of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? That's exactly the way the devil works. He distracts us from the prize. That's what I've said it many a times. There's always distractions in our life. I, just this morning, I walked over to my purse to get something. I, I don't re still remember. I went to my purse to get something I had to do in my lesson. And I don't remember what it was. And I sat down and I thought about something else I needed to do. How come? There's a distraction. When you get down and pray, and you're getting down, and you're really getting into what you're, what you're praying about, and you think about, did I pay that bill last week? Did I take care of that? You know what? I forgot to get gas in my car, and if I go, go to work tonight, there'll be no gas stations open because when I go to work in the middle of the night, there's nothing open in the middle of the night, and totally off of what I'm praying about. It happens to you, too. And then I say, it don't matter about my gas tank. I don't give a care about my gas tank. I'll just say it out loud. Right now, I'm giving my time to the Lord, and my gas tank can just wait. We got distractions, distractions in our life. One of the devil's most effective weapons against God's people is discouragement. Think about the word for a moment. We use the prefix dis to mean no or lack of. For example, disorder means no order or lack of order. Discover means no longer covered. Dis disappear means not appearing. So discouragement then means then no courage. What a terrible uh, pred predicament.
predicament for a child of God. To have no courage. Think about that. To have no courage means to have no faith in God. For if we have no faith in God and his power, we would lack, we would never lack courage. Because if we had faith in God and his power, we would never lack courage. Sorry. One man said discouragement is faith in the devil. When I first read that, I was somewhat shocked. <clears throat> I stopped and thought about it for a while, and really it's true, but in a dramatic sort of way. When we are discouraged, we are doubting God. When you are doubting God, you are believing the devil. Can you imagine such a thing as having faith in the devil? I never wanted to be discouraged or, or to linger in discouragement. Nobody does. Or for anyone for a moment to be discouraged. But after seeing discouragement like that, I certainly have a different look at being discouraged. I certainly do not want to impress or have any faith in the devil. How about you? Discouragement is the best tool the devil uses. Because if he can keep us discouraged, he keeps his finger on us. And as we walk around, he's constantly got his finger on us. We can go to the store with discouragement. We can go to church with discouragement. We can go to work with discouragement. We can pray with discouragement. We can encourage somebody else with discouragement. We constantly live under his finger with discouragement. Somebody said in a, in a little, in a little um, the illustration one time told me and pastor years ago that there was a toolbox laid out. And the devil was standing there with, some, with the child of God. And he said, you can have all, any tool in the toolbox you want. So they picked up this tool. It was really worn. He said, why in the world would you have this tool on, on the yard sale and selling this? He said, oh, that one's not for sale. We're not selling that tool. He said, why? He said, that's my tool of discouragement. He said, it's the best tool I ever use. He said, because I can fake any other of the other tools with that tool right there, discouragement. That discouragement tool, he keeps us down because he keeps us with no courage. Discouragement keeps us under the underlining of everything else. We're having courage in the devil when we're discouraged. This morning, I got up and I was in the shower. And, the, and you know, you all know that the, the pastor's been in the hospital and been sick. And the devil's been fighting him terribly. And I was in the shower. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. He said, But the problem is, we don't pull down the strongholds because we don't realize how mighty they are. And I was like, I got to get out of the shower because I got to go tell Pastor that. So I hurried up and I went in there and I told him, I said, Babe, this is the problem. We're walking around and we're like, oh, you know, this is, you know, this, I feel this, I feel that. No, I'm not accepting that because guess what? My weapons aren't carnal. They're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. That ain't nothing but a stronghold. And guess what? I got the power to pull it down. I'm going to take this power and I'm just going to pull that down and I'm going to pull that down and I'm going to pull that down and I'm not accepting all this stuff. All that is is discouragement. I'm not accepting it because if he can keep me under that little line and under his finger, he keeps me discouraged. He keeps me under that. I'm not accepting it. We got more power than the devil wants us to realize we got because if he lies to us and tells us we don't, we won't use it. We need to realize and get our priorities in line and realize we're more powerful than we realize we are. Distracted disciples, this is what they were. I got to get back to the lesson. It really is easy to become distracted even when we're believers the disciple, or, or disciples of the Lord. Mary, or Martha loved Jesus very much. Do you remember Martha and Mary? They had Jesus over to their house. And you remember the story in the Bible. It says, uh, Martha loved Jesus very much. She loved to have him in her home. However, she became so distracted by the preparations of the meal, she missed the master. 
She wanted the table to look so good. She wanted the food to taste so good. She wanted the house to be in perfect order. Then she became upset when Mary sat at the feet and listened to the words instead of helping her with the work. Remember the gentle rebuke Jesus gave Martha. He told her that she was worried and burdened about many things, while Mary had chosen one thing that was very important. See the contrast between the one thing and many things. Therefore lies most of our troubles in earthly life. We have too many irons in the fire. We have too, many on, too much on our plate. There never seems to be enough time to get it all done. You know, that, you know what I'm saying. We're busy. We're all busy people. But we must be careful that we don't become distracted disciples. Let us love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. But let us first do the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let all the other things be added unto him in his will. Let's not be distracted. Let's get our priorities in line. Let's not be distracted over many things, but be uh, worried about many things, but be worried about one thing. If we put our mind on the master and doing his will, all the other things will fall into place when we worry about those things. Kind of wondering where to go from here. Our priorities have been displaced. Have you ever displaced your priorities? I have. I mean, this. Well, I can just teach about me. I mean, I got. I, I have a, a tight schedule that I go by now that I work a job, and then now that it's at night, I have to go on a tight schedule. When I get off work in the morning, I work all night. I get off. I walk in the door and ask my kids. I walk in the door. I walk straight to the bedroom. I change into my pajamas. I use the restroom. I go straight to bed because I worked all night long. I sleep for a couple hours. I get up. I take my time with the Lord. It's either praying, seeking him, uh, reading my lesson, and then the whole way to work. You know, it's regular stuff through the day, getting the house clean, doing, you know, whatever stuff that I have to do. My time from when I leave for work till I get to work is just me and the Lord. Don't call me. Don't talk to me. Don't bother me. That's my, me and my time with the Lord. That's just the way it goes. Pastor called me the other day. I said, baby, I love you, but this is my time with the Lord. I got to let you go. I'll talk to you later. I'll text you while I'm at work in between patients if I have to. He said, oh, I understand. No problem. I'll let you go. Because this is my time. I have a schedule of the way I do things. Does my priorities fall? Yes. But I've got to, I'm not going to just squeeze the Lord in and fit him into my day. No, that's my time with him, and I'm not taking that away. We put our priorities first. God gives a strong rebuke, though, or through the prophets to let us know that, about their priorities, and they had become displaced. They had no time for God's work and God's will, but they had all the time and money in the world for their own houses and their well-being. God rebuked them for building and living in comfortable houses while the house of the Lord was incomplete. God said in verse 9, Mine house is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. We're suffering terribly in the church from the same failure. We have many who need to reorder their priorities. In this passage, God is not condemning the people because they live in comfortable houses. But he's rebuking them for their more, cons uh, considering, uh, more concerned about their own homes and welfare than about his work. Are we more concerned about our own life than the work of the Lord? Are we more concerned about... What's going on with someone else than we are about the work of the Lord? No, let's worry about souls. Souls is more important. Living for God is more important than having the best house or having a new, new carpet on the floor or having whatever in our own homes. It, it don't mean our homes like our own houses, but our own lives. Having that new dress, having that new pair of shoes. No, let me do something for God. Let me spend more time with the Lord. God knows our needs. He knows what we need. He knows what our desires are. He don't always give us what we want. If he did, I've said it many a times, we'd be spoiled brats. 
You ever met a spoiled brat? I seen one the other day. They want everything. They, they, they just want everything. And if you don't give it to them, then they're, then they're just spoiled. If you don't get that taken care of now, you're only setting them up and you can blame yourself when you get older. And it'll be your responsibility and you will stand before God for that. For allowing them to be that way because the Bible says the rod of correction will drive it far from them. It's your responsibility to make them do right. It's your responsibility to teach them that way. You know, but people say, oh, well, you know, that's just the way they are. No, you, you got a way to teach them. You know, I've sat down with my grandbaby the other day and I said, it ain't when we're in church, it ain't time to jump around and play and all that. She gets in trouble constantly. You know, of course, Nana gets Nana is the one that usually gets her in trouble because, you know, as you can see, she's got a backpack brand new from me from the thrift store the other day, sitting on a pew. And, you know, she has to listen in church. I raised my kids that way, and my daughter's doing the same thing with her, and I'm thankful for that. You know, you need to listen. You need to listen to what Papa's saying. You need to obey. Church is not a place to come and just sit around and be, oh, let's play, let's, let's, let's get on our devices, let's play, let's... No, it's time to listen. Because guess what? When the Spirit starts moving, I'm hoping it rolls over on that grandbaby of mine and she'll desire it. How do you think that the Holy Ghost moved on? Miranda, when she was six years old, she got filled with the Holy Ghost, not because she was sitting on the pew playing on, on her iPad. I mean, come on. That's the way it goes. Church is, if you can't give that time for the Lord, then where our priorities are in messed up. I got off on a rabbit trail. Let me get back on. Okay. We do not want to be misunderstood. God does not um, condemn all material things. He knows that we have, we need a shelter, food, and, you know, clothing, money, vehicles, etc. The Bible does not require a vow of poverty, but it does require a vow, vow of pro, priority. My tongue got all twisted. Um, we, he does, he does, he, he requires a vow of priority. We must take seriously the command. And it commands not a suggestion. It's a command. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. We are supposed to seek the Lord first and his righteousness, not ourselves, not what we want. We're not forbidden to our own material things, but we should not, we should not want those over what the Lord wants for us. However, he has promised to meet our spiritual needs as well as our physical needs. And sometimes our physical needs aren't things we need. I mean, when we're watching people say, Lord, you know, I mean, my favorite car, Pastor said before, baby, what's your favorite car? Well, I think a BMW is, is a cool car. I would never own one. I wouldn't want to own one. Same reason why I don't own a lot of things that's expensive. I've never been an expensive type of thought of a person. Why? Because I don't want anybody to take it from me. It's not my desire. But I like the, the look, I, the older BMW, I liked the look of them. I don't want one. I just liked it. He said, baby, one day I hope to buy you one. I'm like, I probably would never drive it. You know, I don't care. Just give me something that runs, has AC, and that I can get from point A to point B. Ain't going to break down on me. I'll be all right. Why? Because my, my and I don't want it to ever change. My need for the Lord is more important to me. I've already said, make me so obese in the spirit that I, I don't got no more time for the world because I'm so obese eating the word, praying, and I'm so obese in the spirit that I don't got no time for the world. I don't want any time for the world and the worldly things because when I consume myself with the worldly things, my appetite is filled with the worldly things. Then I don't desire the spiritual things. Okay, I've got to hurry. Where does the time go? The pastor has showed us this many a times, and I really don't need to tell you how many hours we're here and how many hours we're there. pastor showed it to us. How that we have 24 hours in a day, and it makes 168 hours in a week, and how we work usually eight hours a day, and there's six days, so that's 48 hours, which is 29% of the week. Let's assume we're able to sleep eight hours each night, 
So that's 56 hours. So that's 33% of time we sleep. Let's assume that we spend two hours a day eating. So that's 14 hours a week, 8% of the week. Uh, that, that's a good idea. So let's see. Let's assume that we pray about 15 minutes a day. So that's about two hours a week that we pray. That's only 1% that we pray. So let's say that we go to church uh, four services a week, which we don't do that. We don't go that. We only go two. So, but still, that's, and they're about two hours long. So eight hours. Um, 5% of the week is doing that. So where's our time? We spend more time doing worldly things than we do doing spiritual things. Where's our time going? What percentage of your time goes to spiritual matters? And where is your priorities? Are, we, are our priorities on things of the world or are they on things of God? Then we'll know where our life is and where we're headed to when we know where our priorities are. How often have you heard someone say life is just a rat race? What they're, what, what they're meaning is, is life is, a, is like a constant blur of activity and business, and it seems to get nowhere. People who put worldly things first never get ahead. Haggai discovered that as he was putting money into bags with holes. That's what the Bible said. Said he was just putting money into bags with holes. Said the more we strive to prosper material, materially, the more... Our spiritual matters fail. There's more we suffer lack. Yet it is true that those who put God first will prosper in the most important life, the spiritual part. They will be content in the, in the material, in earthly things. I already said that a second ago. When we strive and strive and strive for more earthly things, we will want more earthly things. When we strive and strive and strive for, for spiritual things, we will want more spiritual things. It's what we put in our appetite. You know, if I fill myself with my favorite food, I'm going to want that all the time. If you're on a diet, any of us ever been on a diet, if you're on a diet and you're, you eat carbs all the time and then you go on a diet against carbs, guess what your body's going to want? Every carb you can think of. Lord, have mercy. Your body will crave carbs. You'll dream about carbs. That's just the way it goes. My son, Stephen, he cracks me up. He loves bread. Loves bread. Well, they've been on this different diet thing where he can't have anything. The other day he came to the house and he said, I just want a loaf of bread. I'll just eat the whole loaf of bread. And I just got to giggling because he's always loved bread. My grandbaby loves bread. They're just bread eaters. He said, I just want a whole loaf of bread. That's all I want for dinner is just a loaf of bread. And I just got to, to laughing because I could just see him sitting there with just a loaf of bread, not even sliced, and just chowing down a loaf of bread. He'd be happy over a loaf of bread. But that's because he's filled himself with that for so long. But now that you pull away from something, you want it more because you're used to filling yourself with that garbage for so long. Carbs aren't good for you, by the way. Okay, so priorities have directly affected your spiritual life. When you have bad priorities, they directly affect us. Because of Judah's distraction with his own welfare and neglect of the house of the Lord, they were in the state of coldness. They had no zeal for God, their love had faded, and they needed revival. They needed to put first things first. When you allow your priorities to get out of place, you will suffer spiritually. In verse 12, we read that the people obeyed the voice of the Lord. But then God spoke again and promised them, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. If you will obey him and order your priorities properly, he will give you praise. How do we expect to have the seal of approval on our life? if we're not doing the will of the Lord. You know, I, I have, which I'm getting to that. Hold on, because I'm getting ahead of myself. It says, when the people proved their desire for God and to build his house, he, they spent the, he sent his word again by Haggai and promised that the desire of the nation, that the world would refer, no doubt, to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God also promised that he would... 
fill their houses with glory. What wonderful promises, even though their effects seem feeble in their own eyes compared to the temple that used to exist. God honored their obedience and gave them the assurance of the Savior. I've had people say to me before, which I've, I missed this a second ago somewhere, I can't afford to pay my tithes. I just can't afford it. And I'm not here to talk about who does or who don't. I don't know. I don't get into that. But the, the, the lesson had talked about it. And they say, I can't afford to pay my tithes. That's a priority in our life. It should be a priority. And if you get down to, to the reason, you know, y'all already know that tithes don't go to, to pay for me and pastor and we don't live in some huge, you know, expensive home and don't go to us. So, I mean, most people say I don't pay my tithes because I don't want the pastor going to a steakhouse. I've heard it. I've heard it said when we evangelize. I don't pay my tithes because then that pastor goes out to eat too much. Well, this pastor and pastor's wife don't, but it don't matter. Anyway, the tithes go into the church to pay for the house of the Lord. Justin was little one day, and we, we were pastoring in Mayaka, and this is how you see things in a feeble mind. The money came into the church, and he was helping me count the, the tithes. We just had a little church. He was helping me count the offering. And he said, Mama, how does Jesus get this money? Because he always knew the money went to the Lord. It was the Lord's money. And I said, well, you know, it goes into the churches for the Lord. He said, so he comes down and gets it, and he, and he tells you which bills to pay. And I'm just, you know, and I said, yeah, baby, something like that. And I just blew it off. Well, he went home and told his daddy. He said, Daddy, guess what? I'm so excited. Jesus comes down and gets that money that Mama counted today. And I got so tickled over that. We laughed and laughed and laughed because it was so cute. But it's the money belongs to the Lord. It don't have nothing to do with nobody else. So people say, I can't afford to pay my tithes. Well, guess what? I can't afford not to pay my tithes. I have lived too long not paying them. The Bible says that he will open the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. But what people don't understand is it's not always a physical blessing. It's not always money back. Sometimes it's grace. Sometimes it's mercy. Sometimes it's just forgiveness. Sometimes it's just blessing and peace and joy. I walk around a life, I walk around a job where people are some of the most miserable people you'll ever meet. About every room I go into, nobody's got no hope, no peace, no, no nothing. And they don't want to see somebody who's going to stick them. I, this is what I get. Hello, I'm Christy from the left. Ugh! Every time. And I'll say, I'm sorry you feel that way, but good morning. I'm, I'm glad to see you. You're looking nice today with all that dried stuff all over your face is what I'm thinking. That's what I think, but I don't say it because, you know, they just woke up. And you don't have nothing dried on you. I'm just kidding. So, uh, but I have to bring some peace to them and make them think, you know what? Instead of being so hateful, and so then I'll say, I don't order the test. Your doctor orders the test. I just come in and fulfill them so that when he comes in, he's got everything ready. I work, but that was my choice. I chose to work with people that are sick and grumpy and miserable because they don't feel good. That was my choice. But guess what? I can bring that peace and comfort and joy, but I wouldn't have that if I didn't have the Lord. I'd be just as grumpy and mean and hateful as someone else. You don't know the peace and the comfort that you'd have when you obey the Lord. People say, how do you get through those things with the Lord when you put the Lord first? All right, my ending, I'm going I'm to close this out as quick as I can here. Though they found it hard to believe it really, it really did come true, over 500 years later, Jesus and his, or Jesus, God's son, came to the temple they, um, that they had remodeled by Herod, and they read from Isaiah, prophesied concerning himself and his ministry. So it did come to pass. All these things that, that the Bible had said came to pass, and he actually read in the Word about what was going to happen when he actually came. So that was what was so amazing. Our illustration says, A friend of mine early lost his, almost lost his life in a flying accident a few years ago. I had breakfast with him sometime after the accident, and I asked him how his accident and his lingering physical problems had affected him. He said, Bill, 
I see life so much more clearly now. My relationship with Jesus Christ is now of a supreme importance. Sometimes we need to get our priorities right to realize how important it is to serve the Lord. And why does it have to come to that? I mean, I've, I've said many a times, why do we have to come to near death? Or why does the Lord have to shake us to where we almost die or we end up in a wheelchair paralyzed? I've seen some of the greatest men and women of God end up paralyzed or shook to the very core of their life, almost close to death, before they'll cry out to God. I just, I'm thinking, I just feel so bad for the Lord sometimes. Because if I had to make my kids love me or cause something to happen to them to get them to love me, that'd be a terrible life. I mean, we all say, you know, we all have our own feelings, and a lot of times I have to think about what the Lord feels like. What if the Lord had to, to, I mean, he begs people to love him. How pitiful. He's begging us to go to heaven. He's saying, please, if I'll just do this for you, maybe you'll call out to me. Maybe you'll serve me. I love you so much, I don't want you to go to hell. Would you please turn your life around? But he has to cause all these things to happen to us to get us to turn our life around because we're some of the most stubborn people you've ever met. Amen. We are stubborn. We think we got life all figured out, and we know what we want for our life. But guess what? Hell is real, and like Pastor preached last week before he ended up, the week before last, before he ended up in the hospital, Jesus is coming soon. Why do you think the devils fought him so hard? Because he preached the truth. Why do you think we're fight, fighting the devil like we are? Because he preached the truth. And we won't stand before God with your blood on our hands for not telling you the truth. That will be your own choice. We've got to get our priorities in line. If we don't get our priorities in line, Jesus is going to come back. And we're going to be still left standing here. We're making our bed harder than it is in life because of our own priorities. Let's, let's pray about that this week. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor.